What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. Uh, we got a great episode here for you tonight. Excited about this one. Uh, it's going to definitely have me wanting to start tournament fishing. I know I talk about it sometimes, and um, it might not be the best time in my life to start tournament fishing, but but it's gonna it's gonna happen here soon, um, just for fun, for the most part. But um, before we get into the, the the meat of this podcast, just a reminder: uh, if you do love this podcast, you want some extra content, you want to help support us financially. Go check out our Patreon accounts. Um, the links will be in the YouTube description as well as in uh, the description of any of the podcast platforms that you're listening through. And go check out our Facebook group. It's Eastern Current Fishing on Facebook. Hop on there. You can uh, communicate with us, with uh, other listeners, and, and kind of you know ask any questions on there. And um, we've got a good community on there, people to answer questions, if not myself, uh, on there answering the questions for you. So go check that out. Um, but without me uh, rambling too much longer, I'm going to bring on our guest here, Mr. Michael. What's going on, man? How are you doing? I'm doing good. Do, doing good as well. It's, uh, Michael's been very flexible with me since I just had this baby. Uh, I've been kind of swinging him around trying to f- figure out a time to sit down and, and do this podcast. We have a mutual friend, uh, Z-Man, Daniel. How do you say Daniel's last name? I can never never remember how to pronounce it. Nussbaum. Nussbaum. Okay, cool. Well, yeah. you re- I read it and I'm, I'm a little little thrown off, but yeah, Daniel over at Z-Man, he connected us and, and uh, just excited to have you on the podcast. He's got a really cool story. Um, and I think a lot of, you know, good information for people that want to hopefully get out there and catch some more redfish. So uh, excited for that. Well, let's, uh, let's kind of give you some time to take us through your story of fishing, like where the passion started and kind of how you've gotten to where you are today. Uh, well, it really started when I was just a little kid, like four or five years old and my family, my dad, everybody's from Alabama. So he grew up bass fishing, didn't really do any saltwater fishing. And they moved here to Panama City Beach whenever I was, like, right before I was born. So he had no, you know, saltwater fishing experience other than, you know, just basically bass fishing in saltwater. Yeah. So we used to go down and start wade fishing down where we could get on a grass flat with easy access from the, the road. And uh, just wade fish and catch some small trout and redfish every now and then. And just kind of whatever bit. And then just started realizing, like, all right, this is pretty fun, you know. And I – we. The cool thing is my dad and I, you know, a lot of guys that saltwater fish, guide, fish tournaments, you know, they learn stuff from their dad, and then their dad learned it from his dad. Well, since he moved down here, you know, right before I was born, we basically know a lot of the same things. So we've kind of figured it out together on our own. We've had some help from friends and stuff that said, yeah, come, you know, hop on the boat with us. But a lot of what we know is just kind of through trial and error, figuring it out, and, you you know, just started fishing you know, on the weekends out of a boat now and then we'd, there would be a little local tournament come around we're like yeah well, you know we'll fish that and i grew up when the ifa redfish series and all that was really big on tv the flw redfish so you would i grew up watching it on saturdays on tv thinking man that's so cool i want to do that so bad because you know you see bass fishing on tv all the time but you know i catch redfish you know so i right, right. could relate to that a little bit better so that's something i always wanted to do and i think we fished our first IFA back when they used to come to Panama City a lot more often than they do now. When I was like 11 or 12, and we, the weather was terrible. There was actually a tropical storm that was hitting on that day, it, <laughs> like directly Panama City. We had like 35, 40 mile an hour winds, and uh, we we caught two fish and weighed them in. wasn't much of anything. But we were so thrilled just to weigh in two at that time. That was like a huge milestone. Yeah, is weighing in two fish in a big tournament like that, and. Uh, but yeah, ever since then, we just started traveling a little more and fishing other stuff, and then I kind of realized that I could make a living out of it, so that's where I am now. Heck yeah, man. That's so cool, and I just love that you and your dad kind of learned it together um, and have that relationship together of of uh, you know just being able to fish and spend that time on the water, man. I, th- I think you know a, a father-son or father-daughter or mother-son, mother-daughter relationship is, is you know so strengthened through fishing. As well as any other relationship, you know, any friendships, any any buddies that I've fished with. I mean, really now, with the little bit of time I have that's free time, I mean, granted, I am a fishing guide, so I spend a lot of time on the water, but, yeah, I mean, my free time I'm spending, like, the guys that I hang out with on my free time are fishing buddies that I'm going to yeah. go fishing with or talk fishing about, and so um, there's just such a strong root there, and especially, like, in, a, in families, like, when families fish together, it's just, it's really cool, and I love seeing that. Um, tell me, is it ever, you know being a tournament partner with your dad is that ever a tough thing or would it, would it sometimes be parts of it be easier to be with just another buddy or or, or whatnot or, is, or do you love it love every part we of it? fish we fish well together really well we know we kind of know 
I don't know if it's just because we've been doing it so long together or, you know, physically being blood, but I kind of know exactly what he's thinking. He knows what I'm thinking. I know what he's about to do and vice versa. Um, and it's really awesome fishing with him. And I think the only negative to it is like, let's say you and I started fishing tournaments together. Yeah. You know your home area. I know my home area. You may know some other places you like to fish, and I know some other places I like to fish. We can combine that knowledge. Yeah. And uh, you can, like, you know, I don't know anything about fishing up in the Carolinas or anywhere really on the East Coast up past Jacksonville, really at all that much. And I don't know how often you've ever come down to, you know, Panama City, the Emerald Coast area over here, but, you know, we could combine that knowledge. Definitely. Whereas my dad and I, even when we go somewhere like Louisiana or Texas or the East Coast of Florida, we're learning that together. So basically, like I said, everything we know, we know the same things. So I'm not getting that help from somebody who may live in Louisiana that, you know, I go over there and he's already been scouting for a whole month and he knows the water because he's born and raised there where we're really kind of the same person as well, you know, as far as right. like knowledge. And that's most determined fishing is knowledge. Not really. All of us can cast, you know, everybody can cast and reel on a fish, but it's knowing what to do, where to be and why that's happening. Yeah, definitely, man. That's huge. I think that plays into also just the importance of networking as a fisherman, like with your, with your buddies that are around you, with your buddies, you know, further down the coast, up the coast. I see that with like, even as it, things as simple as like migrating fish, like I'm texting my buddies in South Carolina, Hey, are y'all seeing Kobe off the beach yet? And, and just exactly. being able to run these different, you know, scenarios, um, and, and then these different, you know, this different Intel from different people, it really helps you grow. And, I talk about that on here a lot is networking, you know, whether it's just your small group of friends that you redfish with and each person has a boat and you can kind of bounce spots and ideas off of each other or, or you know, as large as tournament fishing. But um, that's huge. I've never even really thought about that. Are there a lot of tournament partners that are actually from different states or like, you know, decently different areas? I would say it's about 50 50. Okay. And, uh, you know, most of the time, a lot of the guys that you see competing and doing well all the time. And I mean, that doesn't mean anything I've done extraordinarily well going over to louisiana and catching you know fish over there that i didn't know were there a week ago but right. you uh you know it, you see a lot of guys doing that and then the other half of the guys tend to be kind of in the same area they're friends you know they work together or whatever but at least you know even when the tournaments come to their home waters a lot of times you know if they both have a boat they may have go found you know one of them may have found some fish somewhere you know that a week before on the weekend fishing where the other one didn't so yeah definitely generally you know it's about 50 50 on okay. guys that split up regionally cool yeah that's uh that's super cool and um it's it, it is always surprising like the when i talk to people about tournament like tournaments that they're fishing is like you almost always expect oh the hometown person to win but then you you bring in somebody else and that starts thinking a little bit differently and it, it's surprising you know how how you can outfish someone who's who's grown up fishing that piece of water just because your wheels are turning a little differently and maybe, you know, a trend or a technique that you've picked up on in Panama City is working real well in Texas or, or vice versa. Uh, I personally hate fishing my home water. I, I do? do not like fishing tournaments here. You know too much. Yeah. You know way too much. You you start thinking, oh, well, you know, a month and a half ago I caught a good one over here. And then, you know, you're running all over. And I, I tend to do a lot better in areas that I don't fish that much because you stick to your original plan. You just put the troll motor down know, and go. Exactly. Rather than thinking way too much and overthinking, because you may have 30 different spots to have good fish and, you know, you're running and gunning and, you know, trying, trying too hard. Yeah. You can't catch them while you're on plane. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, maybe somebody's done it before, but I've never done it. Um, Not me. Well, cool. Cool. Well, let's talk a little bit. Well, I also, first off, just for my own sake, I want to talk a little bit about your boat very mm -hmm. jealous of your boat and I, I i like that boat a lot tell me why you've chosen that that boat well first tell me what it is and tell me why you've chosen that boat and kind of how it works for you guiding as well as tournament fishing i'm running a mayak 22 extreme they're out of uh, south texas corpus christi actually and you know when you get to louisiana and texas you see those mayak boats all over and they're really known for their like tower boat cat tunnel style shallow water boats but they make a few v holes and i run the 22 and I just think for an ultimate guide boat and tournament boat, you know, mm -hmm. there may be a better guide boat out there and there may be, I don't, I don't know if there really is a better tournament boat. Out of, I mean, there's a lot <laughs> of really good tournament boats that are just as good, but for both, it's hard because I can take four guys on my boat pretty comfortably. Three is a breeze and plus myself. And then I can also in a tournament run 70 miles an hour 
and have a nice live well to keep fish alive and still float in a foot of water. And it, the one thing that shocked me is how well it actually rides. Obviously, you know, a lot of times you get these go fast boats and they'll ride pretty bad because they're so light. But it, it, every time I get, you know, back to the ramp or back to the dock after a guide trip, everybody's like, man, you know, it rides so well. We figured we were going to get beat up and it just, it does phenomenal. That's awesome. So the, is the true draft on that boat around a foot? It, we always talk about the bottom. So if I'm on a hard sand bottom, yeah. no, that's about 14 inches, give or take. And that's like, when I say draft, I mean fishing. Like, I don't mean sliding the boat on the bottom. Right, I right. I mean comfortably run the trolling motor, be able to fish. Um, but in like Louisiana and stuff, sometimes I'll go across a shallow section with that loose mud and I'll have that boat in less than, uh, less than a foot, you know, but it's also kind of setting down on the bottom. But I can tell you that my dad and I we were scouting for a Florida pro back when it was a Florida pro in Jacksonville and we somehow lost track of time and those tides over there are huge compared to what we're used to yeah. over here. And we ended up getting stuck for a few hours cause the, you know, the tide dropped out on us and I kind of at that time realized like, all right, you know. We're going to be waiting here for a while. So I was sticking with my measuring stick in the bottom to really see how much water I needed to get out. And it was about 13 inches, give or take. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I think that so many people talk about the draft. Like you never really know what to trust the draft on a boat. But but I'm with you. Like the what I really care about, I mean, one, what you can get it through is, is important running. But the mm-hmm. most important thing is like, all right, what can I comfortably fish in? Like what, what amount of water do I need to pole or to trolling motor along and, and be able to do this type of fishing. So do you ever feel like that's too much draft? Like do you ever, is there times where, where you wish you floated a little shallower? Honestly, I mean, I don't know what it's like, like I said, up in your area where you fish and everything, but yeah. around here in Louisiana, I don't really have much of a problem. Every once in a while you'll see some fish tailing up shallow that I kind of wish I could get up to. But one thing I wanted to reiterate on is, the reason my draft is so good compared to a lot of guys that may have the same boat as me that may say, oh, it's not 13 inches, it's 15 or whatever. I'm running lithium batteries, and weight is a huge thing on that boat oh, yeah. as far as speed and draft and everything. So taking that weight out was huge on those, you know, that just one 36-volt battery underneath that console made a world of difference on that boat. But no, I mean, I the way I like to fish my style, it doesn't really, it's not a big hindrance or anything. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that's... uh. I feel like you really learn to fish your boat too. So whatever boat you end up getting, whether you know yours, I have a, a Maverick uh, HPXS, which is a, which is a much smaller boat, mm-hmm. um, and I, I've really learned to to fish that boat well. But it, it, you kind of learn to adapt to what you um, what you're on. You learn how to fish that well. Um, sometimes, like I got a buddy that that is a is a kayak fisherman, but we are we're big time we're talking about that network. We're always talking every day, like back and forth. We fish very differently very different stuff but we always talk about how i'm really comfortable you know with a two feet or less under my boat mm-hmm. as far as catching fish and i get like yeah. over five feet of water and i'm like oh my gosh i don't know what to do and then yeah. he's like he needs like 10 feet to 20 feet to go catch fish and we'll catch the same fish but it's all you know you, you learn how to fish and what you're you know what your what your well i guess this kayak could get pretty shallow too but you get the plan yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm bringing it across but yeah those those boats are really cool man and if I didn't have, like I started my business really focused on the fly fishing thing, mm-hmm. um, and I still love that, but I, I re- I'm not a purist by any means, and, and I would love to to sell that boat and get a tournament boat, but it just wouldn't make sense for, for what I uh, what a lot of my clients do. So they yeah. like to see that pulling platform on the back of the boat, <laughs> even if and they that's can't. That's how I started. That's, that's how you started? I had, yeah, I had a little 18-foot Bossman, actually. Oh, cool. It was uh, you know, it was a real good starter boat for me, and I did the same thing. I would just take two guys at a time, and I would get back there and pull, and I really enjoyed it. It was awesome being able to – you feel like you're a lot more in touch than, like, most of my guy trips. So I just point the trolling motor, say, all right, you know, cast out this side, and we'll catch them going on this bank or whatever. Yeah. But back when I would do that, I would get up in the shallow stuff, and that's what I was thinking when he said, you learn how to fish your boat. Because that's how I started was pulling just like you're doing. But then down here, it's such a – you know, vacation place, Panama City Beach, that you get a lot of family. So I had to, you know, right. go bigger. Right. No, it, it, it definitely, it's definitely uh, nice to have that larger platform. Um, so do you do you run a tower on your boat when you're tournament fishing? So if I'm sight fishing, I got a tower that I actually have two different ones that I'll strap down on the front. Okay. Um, that The reason I have two is because the power pole, they had a, they did this thing with like a height restriction, like no more than four foot, which... I personally, like, I would be one of those guys that would be totally fine if they got rid of towers and tournament fishing because it can get pretty ridiculous. I have a, 
it's people are going to think I'm crazy. I have a six and a half foot tower that I'll put on the front of my boat just for Louisiana because it's such a help. It's a game changer. If you're not, if you're not sight fishing over there, then, and you're catching them, if it's, a, you know, it's different if it's on a pop and cork and it's dirty water and windy, but if it's a nice day and you're not sight fishing over there, you're putting yourself at a huge disadvantage. I don't use it very much at home because I feel like our fish are pretty spooky and, uh, it, our water gets so clear that I think they can see you. A lot, you know, you'll catch better fish a lot higher. of times from yeah. You'll catch a lot of better fish from the deck a lot of times. But yeah, I, but I love sight fishing. I mean, that's by far. If I'm going out for fun, I'm sight fishing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, is that is that a big talk of, of doing doing away with towers in, in a lot of those tournaments? I, I think it's impossible to do it because especially over in Louisiana and Texas, the tower boats are so such a huge thing where the guys are driving from up top, you know, and they don't even have a console down on the bottom. Um, and there, you know, so many tournaments are in Texas and Louisiana and stuff. I don't know how they would do it unless they just wanted to exclude those guys and said, you know, go buy a different boat or cut that thing <laughs> off or whatever. But, you know, I, I just think that a lot of times you, you don't, it's fun sight fishing. I love sight fishing, you know, seeing that fish and throwing at them and watching them eat, but you don't, you're not in tune with the fish as much because you're just, on your troll motor going around you're going way faster on your troll motor because then you'll just see a fish instead of going slow because you don't know if that fish is there and really paying attention to all the variables and yeah yeah where the water's moving and that kind of stuff you're just on there just buzzing through somewhere on your tower and throwing at fish yeah that's very true i i I see that uh that kind of perspective now for sure i mean one of the i remember there was one tower boat one time in louisiana and it was when the What's the biggest tournament they have down there? It's usually in like November, maybe October in Hopedale. Probably the, probably the IFA Championship. Yeah, it's IFA they Championship. Do out of, they do out of Hopedale a lot. Um, and and so there'd always be all these people. I actually lived in Hopedale for multiple winters. Um, right right before you go over that little bridge, before you hang that left, mm-hmm. I was in a little trailer up there on the right, about forty five yeah. feet up in the air, and uh, and um, I was coming back into uh, the Mister Go one day that big ditch there and come around this corner out of this this one little creek and there was a dude i think it was a scb and that scb is a, is a yeah. tunnel boat um mm. th- that that boat had to have like a 30 foot tower on it it was so high it was i mean i was running past them looking up like this trying mm. to uh to figure out what was going on there but uh, i mean i gotta imagine you could see fish from i mean even just from a pulling platform the the amount of perspective you get is insane so being up that high um, it's got to be insane in that shallow water. Mm-hmm. And you said so. You said power poles made it where you can only um, run a run a four and a half feet. You said, yeah, four foot. And I four and that's what you were talking about getting rid of it or whatever. I think that's the way to do it. Is because you can still guys with pulling platforms. You can still fish on your pulling platform because usually they're not you know more than four foot. Right. And the only guys that have an issue are guys with like second stations on their boats, like running bay boats or, or those tower boats. But they made a rule where. You know, they, they do a polygraph if you win. So, and there's also kind of the honor system that, you know, you can have that on your boat, but you got to drive from down low and you got to, if you want a tower, you got to have a four foot tower and you got to, you know, put it on your boat where you're not above four foot. And I think that's the way to do it is because it puts everybody on an equal playing field and you can still sight fish. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about, um, and we talked about this pre-show, but let's jump into, um, first off, like kind of some of the the baits that you like to throw as a tournament fisherman on a tough day i think that's what i want to learn from you as well as i think other people um, will find you know helpful is um when you're fishing a tournament and the weather's sucky and you can't sight fish what are what are some of the baits that you're confident in searching with um and and let's start and we'll kind of go through that i might i might ask you some questions about like you know Mm -hmm. retrieve and stuff like that but um take me through your confidence baits if you will your search baits if you will so definitely like a, the number one search bait, and I think this bait in particular has caught more fish than anything else. And you know, Z-Man's not going to love it, but I think a gold spoon. I yeah. think a gold spoon or a copper spoon is just a killer redfish bait. And a lot of times, even when they're not feeding, people you know usually fish slower and throw a little tiny finessey plastic. But you get that reaction bite sometimes when you're just bringing that thing by them, and they see it go by, and you'll get a hit. And you can just put the troll motor down. And hit a bank or you know fish wherever area you are and just chunk that spoon. I mean, it seems like a million miles if you're using light yeah. line and just you know cover water like crazy. And I think a gold spoon, even it sounds crazy, but even sight fishing in Louisiana and stuff, 
if I, I prefer a plastic to throw because they the way they come through the grass and stuff and you know you generally hook them with a plastic like a, at a good spot on their mouth you don't tongue hook them or anything but there's days where if they're not biting you take that gold spoon and you just sight fish for that thing just yeah. drop it right in front of them and they'll eat it but and then it goes to the other side where um actually a bait for me that i started fishing like crazy and i almost always fish it in the summer is z-man makes that uh streaks 3.75 it's like a little tiny fluke yep and i strike makes a one aught jig head i take the 3 16 jig head on the pearl streak 3.75 and it's tiny i mean this thing is a little tiny bait and i'll just throw that thing out there and start just twitching it and it's just darting around in the water and i've been on i mean you can ask some of my clients and stuff i've been on schools of fish that you could throw anything in even live bait on guide trips and they won't hit it, but you take that streaks and start bouncing it through them, and they just see it and they just hit it. I think it's just a reaction bite, or I don't know, but it's something small they'll eat, and it 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 catches fish. I mean, it's a it's a killer. Yeah, I think any those flukes, man. The I think they're one of the best baits at, at drawing a bite out of a fish. You know, it just triggers that they don't even have time to think about it. It's this quick little dart, and they're either got to eat it or let it go. Yeah. Um, then those streaks, I've fished them a little bit, but I haven't fished them a ton for redfish. I fished them more for trout here, mm-hmm. uh, but I need to try that. We get our winter, our schools in the winter that'll be that can get really, really picky, and that that sounds mm-hmm. that would probably be a great bait for it. Uh, but yeah, that spoon, man, it's that is a great, great bait. I, and the you know I like those Johnson spoons with that weed guard. I mean, a lot, and even like the yeah. the Aqua Dream has a great weed guard. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can throw that like here at our higher tides, we get a lot of like flooded spartina grass that's not fully flooded like a you know like a tailing flat or anything like that but it's just like the edges of the spartina grass floods mm-hmm. um, or spartina grass floods and and a lot of times those fish are sitting right in that and they're hard to target with much you know but those gold spoons you can throw them past them and just kind of slide into that grass and i catch yeah. a lot of fish at the higher tides with that and you know out in open water and the muddy water they mm-hmm. really are exactly. really are great baits um do you do you fish much top water do you fish top water as a search bait very often it- it's so funny you say that because I actually called my dad the other day after a guide trip, and I said, "Man, we're making a mistake, but we've gone away from top water. We've really quit throwing top waters. I still throw like a twitch bait, like Savage Gear makes a twitch reaper. It's like a almost like a mirror dean, but I yeah, kind yeah. of like the shape and the action of it a little bit better. Um, and we'd still throw those and stuff. But I told him I was like, we have really gotten away from throwing top water because." You know, you see that fish come up and he might miss it. Or you see him, you know, they, you miss a lot on top water, at least around here. They'll come up and boil at it and hit it and not get it. And you think in your head, wow, if I was throwing a paddle tail or a spoon, he probably would have got it. But I was running a trip the other day and I had my, I had three guys. I had one guy throwing a spoon. I had one guy throwing a, a Z-Man diesel minnow. And I had another guy throwing uh, the Savage Gear uh, hard mud minnow. It's like a four-inch, just normal, traditional walking style top water. Yeah. And I said, you know we're just going to cast all these baits you know we'll catch them we're going to go down this bank you know the normal just cast yeah, bring it in yeah, yeah. Deal. my guy on that top water was catching all the fish and i'm like well maybe maybe you know they're not doing the baits right so i started watching my other guys and they're doing everything perfect and i was like well you know let me tie another one on and then now both of those guys are just crushing them on a top water and then i tied a third one on and everybody's still on top water and we're catching all our fish on top water and it really makes you think. I mean, there's a lot of days where I wouldn't throw a top water, but obviously, you know, there's a time and a place when that pressure gets right, and those fish really key in on those top waters. I guess you can't beat it. Yeah, man. When they want a top water, they'll they'll uh, they won't let one slide by. Um, mm-hmm. So speaking of pressure, is that something you play pay much attention to with fishing, barometric pressure, and you know, high pressures and low pressures and all that? <laughs> I do. I mean, I know it makes a difference, but the way I look at it is I got to go catch them either way. Yeah. And I don't, at least around here, you know, there's not like a spot like, okay, this is a good high pressure spot and this is a good <laughs> low pressure spot. I know that, you know, obviously it makes a difference in how the fish are feeding and how they're, you know, aggressive they're going to be and stuff like that. But, you know, really for me, I just still fish, you know, sometimes depending on what the pressure is doing, I'll change baits, maybe slow something down, speed something up. But I mean, I don't really... You know, I know it's a factor, and I know maybe guys who are way more in tune with it than I am can really pinpoint in on stuff. But for me, I know you know either way, we got to go out there and catch them. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And uh, yeah, I don't, I'm with you. There's definitely not like a here. There's not a high pressure. Oh, when it's high pressure, this is where I want to be. Or it's, yeah. it's just like yeah. what the heck do these fish want today? Um, well, sweet. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, as far as as you know 
being a tournament angler, it, you you really have fished a lot of water. Um, so what do you look for, you know, in a, in a, other than fish in the water? Like w- when you go to a new place, what are you looking for as like, all right, this is probably going to be a productive area. Um, and what are so do you use Google Maps or anything to kind of like look for oyster beds or grass or anything like that? Mm-hmm. So that was going to be the first thing I said. Is satellite imagery is changed the way people can, you know, scout new areas because yeah. you can get a real good look at, you know, how clear is the water over here? You know, you know, how deep does it look? Are there holes? Is there grass and sand? You know, kind of the whole nine yards. Yeah. So that's usually if I'm going to a new spot, I'll get on my phone or my computer and really just go through an area and find something that, you know, appears to be the right water depth. If there's oyster bars, if there's, you know, grass that looks good. I like clean water. I think clean water produces fish. I mean, obviously, I've caught really good fish in dirty water, too. I personally feel more comfortable fishing clean water because I like to sight fish a lot and right. I just that's more what I'm used to at home our water is pretty clean here so it's not that you know dirty water doesn't have fish because obviously it does but that's you know you being comfortable is the number one thing if you're at a spot that you don't think is going to be good and you're not feeling right about it you know generally you know you're not going to catch them as good because you might not be paying attention as much or you know on your cast not being as in tuned with that cast or whatever but um, satellite imagery is a huge thing and then, you know, obviously looking for bait. Uh, birds are a huge indicator. If you're, you know, for example, I'm thinking off the top of my head at the time, I'm going through Louisiana, and I found a pond because I was fishing one spot about a quarter mile away, and I'm up on the tower, and I'm looking over at this other pond, you know, over to my east or whichever way it was, and there are pelicans just diving in that pond like crazy. So I just got down and went and went over there and started floating through there, and there's redfish all over. And it's I would have never went there if I didn't see those birds. So. Yeah. Stuff like that is, you know, a good indicator when you're out on the water. If there's not, you know, predatory birds or, you know, anything else, if there's not life there, you know, a lot of times there won't be that good a fish. Right. And and I'm with you on that too. Like, listen to your gut. If you're in an area and it doesn't feel right, it mm-hmm. doesn't mean like leave immediately. But, it, you know, if you give it a little bit of time, you're not feeling, you're not seeing fish, you're not seeing bait and move. Like that. I think that's so many people's problems that are just getting into this, like, you know, red fishing, maybe wanting to sight fish or or, uh, you know, redfish in this style that we're talking about is they'll just get an area and just beat the same area up and, and move and, and, you know, all right, I'm throwing to the banks today. Like I'm just going to fish, you know, to the bank down this Creek and that's what I'm going to do. You just need to always be scanning back and forth, eyes open, head up, like looking for the signs that the world is giving you that day of like, this is what the fish are doing. This is what the birds are doing. And they're all in this whole, whole kind of relationship together that can really, um, you know, tell you what's up. Like the other day I was fishing a new area here to me, um, some stuff that I hadn't fished before. I got into this Creek system on both banks here. Like what I like on a bank here is like, you know, some scalloped edges and some oyster banks some little oyster rock coming off of it and, and some soft mud. And I looked down it and one bank had like 15 egrets on it. And the other bank had no birds on it. Maybe one. I was like, I'm going to get on the bank with the 15 egrets on it. And <laughs> There exactly. was fish all down that bank, and then I was like, oh, I'll check this other bank because I was really just scouting, and I pulled back down the other bank and saw two or three fish on it, and it was, you know, it, it, those birds told me which side of that creek I needed to look at. Um, so exactly. just, just paying attention to those little things is so huge. Um, and, and the clean water thing too, man, like I, I, I'm with you on that too, but in North Carolina, we just don't have the ability to like, we just don't have enough water to run around and be like, all right. I got to find the clean water. It's more like I've just got to stick with this. Do you find that in, in any of the areas that you're fishing or is it is that a big piece of it, like running around until you find clean water? Uh, it really depends on where I'm fishing. Yeah. Like here at home, it the thing about Panama City is a lot of times if it's dirty, most all of it's dirty. You know, And if you don't have a lot of rain, then the water will be clean. Yeah. Um, obviously, like down by the passes, that gets more Gulf water coming in and out. That, that'll be cleaner generally. But over in Louisiana, that is a huge thing for me. And I think I actually got too worried about clean water because there was this place, there was this big lake over there in Louisiana, and it used to be super clean. And then all of a sudden, I think like a diversion, they're doing those diversions with the rivers and stuff. A diversion is it the Mardi, Gras, the Mardi Gras Pass area? Is that what you're talking about? Like the Delacroix? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, kind of over that way, but it, it got dirty. Like, yeah. it used to be clean, and then something happened with a diversion. I don't know. And my dog's scratching over there. Oh, you're off. good. Uh, I got a crying uh, baby. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, but they, the diversion opened up, and the water got dirty. And I, I would have never fished that spot if I wouldn't have known before that 
I had caught good fish there. And yeah. I go in there, and you can barely see. You could only see the redfish that they would come up to the top and kind of swim on the surface or float. They would just sit there, um, and they were there. They had still, you know, they were still there. So, you know, I, I really try and find clean water because I feel like I can be more productive because I can move faster on the trolling motor and see more, you know, and easily be able to see if there's a fish there or not and cover more water. But that doesn't always mean, like I said, obviously that doesn't mean there's going to be fish there or not because I've found places that are beautiful, crystal clean water with the right grass and bait and no fish. And then I go to a place that looks like mud and I just throw a cast out randomly and catch a toad. So, you know, it's, it's there's really no rhyme or reason. It's just like you said before, whatever you feel comfortable in. Yeah. It's like there's these trends to follow, but they can all be broken. That's fishing for you. You know, like you could, there's patterns and then they can work every day of the week and then the exact same thing happens next week and they can be completely different. So it's like constantly changing patterns that you have to stay one step ahead of is, is it really what, um, what it boils down to. But, um, I feel like, and I want to hear your opinion on this, is like sometimes I feel like sight fishing screws me a little bit because I get so, my mind so set on seeing the fish in the water um, to know that they're there that when I'm working down a bank and if I, 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 you know, I'm not blind casting, I almost lose that confidence in that area. Do you have that same kind of struggle um, or, or are you kind of doing a, a good balance of sight fishing and blind casting? Uh, I mean, if I'm not seeing them, I'll make some blind casts. Like if I see some water rippling or, you know, something that looks like, you know, fish. But I'm most of the time when I'm sight fishing, if I'm not fishing area like in a tournament where I know I need to sight fish, I'm really doing it to scout. So I'll really just like see a bank or a pond, wherever you're at on the satellite picture, go hit it. And I'll be on that trolling motor up on the tower sight fishing or sight looking, I guess you could say. And obviously see a fish i'll throw at them but i mean i'll i mean i don't know that's kind of a tough one it is a tough question <laughs> it, it, i mean i'll i'll fish you know on the tower and i'll sight fish a bank and you know sometimes like you said you don't see something and you kind of think like oh man you know maybe maybe there's no fish here but then you go down another 300 yards or something and then there's the mother load so yeah definitely if it's just kind of one of those things that can help you and hurt you you know if you're not like i said sometimes like here if you're up on the tower, I think the fish can see you in real clear water, so it can hurt you as well. Do you all have pretty clear water in, in Panama Beach, like even this time of year throughout the summer? It all depends on how much rain we get. We've gotcha. had a pretty dry year, except for this week, of course. It's been raining like crazy. <laughs> but if we get a lot of rain, we get runoff and stuff from our little creeks that will make the water dirty. But we've yeah. had a dry year, so it's been really clean all year. Nice. And do you per, you prefer – do you like a little stain in that water? Like, Because that, that's how I like it here is like – Crystal clear is a little tough. You know, those fish get real picky, but then you get that little bit of stain and it, it seems like they eat better. You can still see the fish really well, but, but, um, I don't know if it's just from a little bit of rain sometimes or, or you know, just a little bit of fresh water influences. Um, I guess I'm asking and answering the question at the same time, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's the same here that, I mean, there's, for instance, uh, I feel, especially when I'm running a guide trip, I feel a lot more comfortable with my clients, especially if they're not, you know, that great a fisherman on a bank that's a little dirtier, which is kind of opposite of what I was just saying. But I think because of that, the fish feel a little better when the water's not crystal clear, like you just said. So, um, I, I, I whenever you get a like a stain, I think it's a perfect medium, like you're saying, yeah. that little like we call it like tea color here. It'll get yeah. like almost like tea color, and it's still clear. It's not muddy, but it's got a little color to it, and I think that does help, you know, the bite. And I do enjoy fishing that. For sure. Um, well, tell me a little bit about about your rod and reels that you like to throw for redfish. Are you are you all spinning rods? Do you fish a lot of bait casters as well, like some of the other tournament guys? Or so in Louisiana, if I'm sight fishing, especially like close quarter situation stuff, like those fish that'll pop up right next to the boat. If I'm throwing like short distance stuff, like quick accurate, I'll I'll throw a bait caster just because I feel like I can be a lot more accurate with one. Um, and that's just me. I know people that think I'm crazy for that, and I know guys that 100% agree. Um, but like, especially Louisiana, if I'm sight fishing, I'm always throwing up bait caster. And then here at home, I basically only throw spinner reels because here making a long cast is the biggest key to catching them here. You just got to cover water and get that bait far away from the boat. But I'm using the new Savage Gear liner rods, the Battletech inshore rods. Yeah. They're the all white rods. They stick out like a sore thumb, but they look <laughs> really good. And then I'm using this year, uh, Daiwa Ballistic, uh, 2,500 size spinner reels, just like 10 pound high seas braid. 
Um, I like to go light. I don't like really beefy stuff. I kind of like to be, at least here at home uh, in Florida, I like kind of lighter tackle, yeah. longer cast. Yeah, definitely. Um, what what size braid are you putting on those 2500s? Uh, I throw 10 pretty much. I'll throw like 15 or 20 on if I'm fishing around oysters or a docks or something. Mm-hmm. And then and then Louisiana on this bait casting reel, I'll throw a 50 pound braid. Yeah. Just it just something that because that, that high drill and all that grass down there, you know, you could have an eight pound redfish hook them and then he goes down in the grass and you got 20 pounds of wet grass on there so oh, being yeah. able to horse them into the boat is a huge advantage are you fishing uh, a leader down there in louisiana or are you just fishing straight to braid not really if i get on an area where i'm trying to figure out why they're not biting i'll throw a leader on just to kind of rule that out but generally they're pretty they're not very skittish over there <laughs> i mean they'll you you said you fished over there so you know how they are i mean they'll come hammer that thing Oh, yeah. So I like to eliminate in like an error, I guess you could say, to tournament. Like that's one less knot that could possibly fail. Now, if you know, like I said, if they're not biting, if something's up, then I'll throw one on just to see. But generally, I don't. Yeah, that's not going to typically be the issue. Me and my buddy there used to another guide buddy who lives in Alamorada, but we both lived there together in the winter. We would always have a, a tournament each season, not a tournament, but just like this competition. Uh, each winter down there to see who could feed the single redfish. Like we'd have a couple days to fish together, feed one redfish the most times. Mm-hmm. Um, so like in one scenario, like casting to it, getting him to eat, not setting the hook, he spits it out, get him to eat it again. And he had one fish there eat a popper 24 times on the fly rod <laughs> in like two minutes. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, so, That's ridiculous. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, you go to, you go from fishing Louisiana back to North Carolina, it can be a little frustrating, but yeah, but yeah they don't care about leader down there typically. And, um, I mean, they can they can get a little spooky at times, but they're 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 pretty uh, playful fish. Yeah. So, well, cool, man. Well, one other thing I wanted to ask you 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 were talking about the lithium batteries. Um, are you are you still running a twenty? Are you running a twenty four or thirty six volt on that that uh, boat you're running? Or, or tell me a little bit about that and, and how those lithiums play into that. So I'm running uh, a thirty six volt troll motor. Um, it's a twenty two foot boat. It's pretty wide, so it's. It's, it's light, but it's a pretty big boat, and I like to go pretty hard on the troll motor. So I run a 36. I'm running one 36-volt uh, lithium battery. It's a 60-amp-hour battery. Um, lithium battery power makes it. They're out of Florida. They're really good guys, and they make a good product here at home, at least home for me, Florida, but in the yeah. United States, so home for just about everybody. Yeah. But uh, Anyone and that cares about red fishing. Exactly. That's right. If they're watching this more than likely, <laughs> then it's home. But uh, – yeah, they, uh, it's a really good battery. Like I said, it's light, and it you know, recharge in like two hours, you know, from pretty much dead to fully recharged, which is huge because I run the new power pull charge on my boat, which is a – I mean, I know everybody throws around the word game changer, you know, and fishing all the time, especially guys with sponsors or whatever. Oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. But that charge really is awesome for me because running between spot to spot, it will recharge my trolling motor battery and my Kraken battery depending on either which one I tell it to do or where it feels like it needs to go. Um, and that with that lithium battery, it accepts a charge and charges so fast that that power pole charge just gives it juice, and it's, I mean, picking it up and recharging. So I got a lot of confidence in that battery. It really hasn't ever let me down, and especially with that new charge, you know, I don't have to worry about going hard on it on a, on a, on a tournament day and it, you know, crapping out on me. Yeah, what is the, the overall weight of that 136-volt battery? 33 pounds 33 pounds god man that's awesome that is incredible i uh i almost pulled the trigger on on two lithium batteries last time i bought batteries but i think i'm gonna move to that in my skiff next but i don't know man i might i might end up with with a with a different boat like 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 you got i'm glad you didn't get we didn't go too much into the boat thing because i'd be sitting here drooling over the whole time it's like the grass is always greener though yeah, um, you know, every, you really need every guy needs about five to ten boats to really have oh, every, yeah. everything that they need um, filled. So that, that power pole charge is that a pretty new? I haven't even heard of that. Yeah, they they put it out at iCast I think two years back, but okay. most everybody here listening to this and all your listeners are probably pretty familiar with power pole. They yeah. they really stand on their product and they won't just throw something out if they don't really know how it's going to react. They want everybody to be happy or as happy as you know. You can get everybody, and uh, it's it just came out. I got mine earlier this year in the spring, and it's it's an onboard battery charger. You can like plug it like right down. Mine's plugged into the wall, charging for the night. But it takes power from your motor, and can charge your trolling motor batteries, okay. or for me battery, and your uh, cranking battery or house battery or whatever. You can put numerous ones on there. 
uh, do 24 or 36 volt. And it just basically just, it ha- it's like it has a brain in there. It knows where power needs to go. Like if you're going hard on your trolling motor and you're moving to your next spot, it'll give your trolling motor battery power. It always gives the preferred charge of your cranking battery because obviously you need to crank your motor up to get home. But <laughs> if your cranking battery is fine, it'll give power to your trolling motor. Or if you need trolling motor juice, you can get on your phone and go on the app and give it all the power to the trolling motor. And it just really gives you complete control over your power in your boat. Yeah, that's really cool. Do, do you feel like you could run around? Like, all right, this might be a hard question to answer, but how long could you go with just running your boat and charging your trolling motor? Could you go, you know, two days of if you had enough gas to, to run around? Would it keep that, that trolling motor charged enough? Or is it just like, oh, I, I guarantee myself I can get through today running my trolling motor as hard as I want? Um, without I mean, it depends on how much you move around, obviously, because yeah. it's charging. But for instance, that's true. If you run to, four minutes a day, then you're not going to get yeah, much charge. Yeah, just hitting one spot and <laughs> running back. But just for instance, yesterday I fished, hit one spot, fished on the trolling motor a little bit, ran to our bridge, caught some bull reds at the bridge, and we had a lot of current and high winds. And I had my trolling motor on spot lock the whole time, which is pretty draining on the trolling motor yeah and then i actually forgot to plug in my uh trolling motor or my charger last night and i was like well you know we're gonna see and i fished all day same thing at the bridge and the winds were howling today so i was really going hard on the trolling motor and i didn't have a single hiccup so that's well, two days of fishing and that's a real life you know that was yesterday and today so it'll it'll keep it going that's something that i need to get because i can't tell you how often i forget to plug my troll motor in. it's not something i use every day but i every yeah. like every year i'm using it more and more mm-hmm. and uh about once a week i forget to plug it in at night so i even put a uh a sign in my on the side of my door in my car when i'm getting out that says plug in trolling motor so that when i open my door i can see it right there and hopefully remember to to plug it in but Oh man, well cool. Well, is there anything else that you uh, want to leave people with that 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 maybe want to get into tournament fishing or want to take their their red fishing to the you know maybe the next level um, before we finish this podcast up? And I know it'll sound a little cheesy, but don't be afraid of anybody. All of us guys that do it, pretty much everybody's a nice guy. They'll be happy to help you. Um, I don't know what my computer's doing. Um, they'll be pretty happy to help you. You know, you'll see these guys like me with a wrapped truck and boat and you know, all the gear and all the cool stuff. And, you know, I, I, the only reason I know this is because I've talked to guys that were like, man, when I first started, I was so intimidated of you guys because you got all the stuff and the sponsors and the fast boats and all that kind of stuff. We were like, oh, I don't know, you know, if we can do it. But all of us will be happy to help you for the most part. And don't be afraid of anybody. Anybody's, you know, could win a tournament any given day. It takes two casts, usually, on a two fish tournament. And it's all you need is just two casts. <laughs> That's a good way so. to look at it. Yeah, just two casts, so you can be, you know, 60 grand in two casts. So it's, uh, you know, it's everybody, and everybody that's doing it started out in the same place that you would start out if you've never done it before. Everybody had their first tournament. So it's, uh, like I said, don't, everybody's really cool. You don't have to really worry about, you know, people being mean to you or looking down on you because your boat, you know, may not be as fast or as new or whatever, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's a huge encouragement for myself even because I'm very intimidated to think about getting into it. I'm like my, my little fly fishing skiff and go fish a tournament in it. But um, I, when you just said that uh, it takes two casts, I'm like, man, that would be a pretty cool tournament format to be like, all right, there's 50 boats here. Everybody gets five casts. You get the whole day to go fish. You get eight hours, but go out there. You can only make five casts. And like, so you pretty much have to sight fish. Yeah. Uh, but it'd be cool to see who, what, what kind of fish were caught with five casts per boat for the day. That would be a long day. Yeah, very knowing, me, I'd, knowing me, I'd make a the wind would blow all five of my casts and it would <laughs> go right behind them or something. So yeah, it would, would it would make you really think about that shot. Well, cool, man. Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on, and hopefully, I'd love to have you back on for some more podcasts in the future. Uh, yeah, I think that this was uh, was awesome, and I hope people enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed it, and uh, it was good having a conversation. Finally, uh, I'll stop bugging you trying to set up a time to do the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not, but we're both this weather and everything's got, I, you know, you seem like you're in the same boat as me. Yeah. Uh, the, we, I'm all out of whack with my scheduling and guide trips and everything with this weather. So for sure. And I appreciate you having me. It was yeah, awesome. man, definitely. Definitely. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll stay in touch and better watch out, man. I'm coming for you in those tournaments here, here soon. <laughs> Come on. I hope I see you. All right, man. Well, good talking to you. And I will, uh, I'll, I'll close this podcast out here. Guys, thanks so much for, uh, for coming on tonight. 
Um, sorry, my computer just messed up, so it threw me off. Thanks so much for checking out this podcast. Y'all didn't come on. Um, and we will see y'all in the next one. Later.